8. Social Psychology Previously, I discussed the relation between reality, perception, and memory within cognitive psychology. The focus of cognitive psychology is on the mental processes, psychoanalysis on the subconscious or unconscious, and behavioral psychology on the empirical observation of behavior. All these approaches in psychology mainly study the human psyche from an individual perspective. But a lot of what we do experience on the outside is experience with other people. So social psychology tries to answer how much of our psyche is shaped by society and how much of society's psyche is shaped by us. There seems to be a push and pull, a kind of tension between individuals seeking freedom and choices while society pushing you to conform. As we saw, behaviorists explain our behavior partly conditioned by the environment. Psychoanalysis blamed our psychological issues on the dark unconscious. As a response, cognitive psychology puts the blame squarely on the individual, arguing that ultimately individuals have the rational capacity to take responsibility. Now, social psychologists saw things from a social perspective, that we individuals are under the rule of society, therefore subject to group pressure. So fundamentally, social psychologists want to know the influence of society over the individual, which causes conformity. Another important question social psychologists ask is how the individual push back against society to cause change. Historical context. One of the biggest developments of the 20th century was group thought, either through fascism or socialism. Two quite opposing projects. To put it very crudely, fascism promoted survival of the fittest ideology, while socialism promoted survival of the weakest. Fascism wanted to cull the weak to make space for the strong, while socialism wanted to cull the strong to uplift the dispossessed. Fascism was a more masculine approach that the fittest should survive, while socialism was a more feminine approach that everyone was equal. But both ideologies tapped into our social psychology or tribal thinking. Are we psychologically wired to be tribal and conform with others? As we saw, fascism and socialism united and mobilized a huge number of people in Europe and Asia. Or are we really free thinkers and autonomous individuals as seen with democracies? It turns out there's a push and pull between the individual and societal force which results in social change. Origin of social psychology. The German philosopher George Hegel argued that the self depends on the existence of others. In other words, a solid idea of the self cannot exist without the existence of other selves within a group or society. He famously argued that we are the product of history. For example, an ancient Greek person is far different compared to an 18th century German in their outlook, sensibilities, and preferences which make up his historical identity. So the root of social psychology can be traced to Hegel, which trickled through Marx and later French school of deconstructionism and postmodernism. Jacques Lacan, born in 1901 and died in 1981, a French psychologist further argued that the individual is created through the language of the other. In other words, a solid self doesn't exist outside the other. So the self can only exist within a group setting. Let's imagine you are the only person in the world. Nobody gave birth to you and nobody came in contact with you. It would be very hard to have a sense of self-identity. A single god in the universe perhaps experiences the same identity crisis. We know ourselves in relations to others. We develop characters because we constantly rub against other people. The first group we encounter is our own family. Virginia Satter, who was born in 1916 and died in 1988, was an American psychologist who argued that family is where we develop personality and role. Therefore, it's like a factory that makes us. Within a family, we grow as we bump into each other, and so we shape each other's personality by feedback, criticism, collusion, and so forth, until we establish a solid self. It's like a pebble that is crushed in the waves, and after years and centuries, it loses all its rough edges and becomes smooth, and we call it pebble. The same is true about us. A totally unruly animal baby turns into a law-abiding citizen after years of education and socialization. 
but at the heart of it is a push and pull. What is pull? Conformity. After the Second World War, there was a thirst among psychologists to explain why so many Germans complied with the Nazis and never questioned their terrible policies. This was particularly a pertinent question among Jewish and those psychologists with some family roots in Eastern Europe. Three of the most famous ones were the Poland-born Solomon Ash, Staley Milgram of Hungarian descent, and his classmate Philip Zimbardo of Italian descent. They carried out experiments to explain how much we conform to society. In other words, we're not as independent thinkers as we believe to be. Solomon Asch, who was born in 1907 and died in 1996, was a Poland-born Jewish-American psychologist who, in 1955, wanted to find out how strong is our urge to conform with society. Of course, in the light of Nazism in Germany, many social scientists were keen to know why so many Germans didn't question Hitler's policies. Prior to him in 1935, a Turkish psychologist, Muzaffer Sharif, whose studies showed that individuals tend to conform when there is no clarity of an answer. In a black and white situation, we are less likely to conform with bad policies or accept an erroneous claim. But when there is confusion, we side with the group. You could say that we are inherently lazy. If you are faced with a clear path and treacherous trail, we choose the easy route. But when we are faced with two dangerous roads, we look to our leaders to tell us what to do. Today in consumerism, people buy products worn by celebrities because we are overwhelmed by the number of choices available. The same is true for YouTube. We watch videos that have more views. But Ash wanted to find out if individuals conform knowing that the group had the wrong answer. His experiment involved 123 male subjects. The subjects were shown two cards. On one, one line, on the other, three lines, each line marked as A, B, and C. They were asked to answer which line, A, B, or C, was the same length as the line on the other card. Ash wanted to know if the subjects would give the answer that conformed with the group. To do this, he always put each unaware target subject within a group of five to seven people who were aware of the experiment. He would ask each person to give an answer. The unaware target subjects would always give their answers last or close to last in the group to test whether the subjects would go against the group by giving the correct answer or conform with the group despite knowing the answer is wrong. In the first stage, there was no group pressure, so only 3 out of 720 gave the wrong answer. But when they were put within a group, more than 30% conformed and gave the wrong answer. Ash saw a clear pattern. Those who went against the grain and stuck with the correct answer consistently did so. And those who were prone to conformity also consistently did so. Ash concluded that the group has a huge influence on some individuals. If the test is done in private, people stick with the right answer. However, in groups, the pressure of conformity is strong enough that people give the wrong answer, despite knowing the correct answer. From this we can conclude that the group has a power to bend the truth. We might go against the truth in order to conform with our group. We often do not tell the truth out of politeness or fear of consequences. Stanley Milgram, who was born in 1933 and died in 1984, was another Jewish-American psychologist who worked alongside Solomon Ash to study how individuals conform in society. After the Second World War, Nazi leaders were put on trial and they claimed that they were following orders. Milgram argued that we tend to comply despite our own personal values because we are taught to obey rules at an early age. To prove that people do what they are told to do, in 1961 at Yale University, he set up an experiment in which ordinary people would inflict electric shocks when they were ordered by those above them. The subjects were told that the experiment was to find whether punishment helped learning or not. The subjects were told to inflict electric shock of varying degrees on learners who gave the wrong answers. Milgram found that all participants applied shocks of up to 300 volts on the learners who would scream in pain. 
65% of participants obeyed orders to apply a maximum shock of 450 volts. Only 35% of participants refused to obey when the learners screamed in pain. However, Milgram also found that the participants showed discomfort and distress while obeying orders, which shows that the pressure of conformity is so high that the participants were enduring a huge discomfort while obeying orders. Quote, Ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part, they can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Some people criticize it, saying that because the study was conducted in a university environment where participants were paid to take part, therefore they were more willing to obey. However, the experiment was replicated in 2006 by Mel Slater using vertical reality and the results were pretty much the same. Stanley Milgram concluded that obedience is not inherent in one culture, but in all cultures. Humans have evolved in tribal settings since the dawn of time, so aligning oneself with the tribe or the authority is a survival tactic we are all evolved with. Since Stanley Milgram's experiment involved obeying orders from authority, his colleague Philip Zimbardo, who was born in 1933, wanted to know if the participants would inflict pain without an authority telling them to do so. In his famous 1971 Stanford Prison Experiment, he selected 24 ordinary students and, and randomly gave some the role of prisoners and some the role of guards. The guards were to arrest the prisoners and keep them in the basement of the university for a period of time. The guards also wore military uniforms and had to strip search the prisoners and had complete power over the prisoners and their job was to keep order. The results were as shocking as Milgram's experiment. And performing their duties, the guards quickly became abusive, denying prisoners food or toilet, and even used them to amuse themselves and their boredom. The situation became so terrible that after six days, the experiment had to be stopped. Zimbardo concluded that any good person under the right condition or wrong condition can turn nasty and do terrible things. Once we assume a role under some given rules, we tend to take it too far if pushed. So far we have seen that individuals are pushed by society. They have the capacity to conform, in some cases much to the detriment of their own psychological state. This can be seen among soldiers who after a brutal war suffer immensely for what they did or witnessed. So how do you liberate individuals from the tyranny of social conformity? or how to enhance our ability to make the right moral choices in life, or how to go against the normalization of society. If psychological trauma affects the individual, it can also affect an entire group. Creative freedom or push. Eric Fromm, the German psychologist, argued that the problem most modern people face is loneliness due to our separation, first from nature due to our ability to reason, and secondly our separation from others due to modern disintegration of community, family and groups. His antidote was love, not in the usual sense. This freedom is the capacity to encompass the world and reconnect with nature as well as other people through imaginative art. Creative artists do not seek conformity, but rather choose loneliness in order to capture something deeper. So creative freedom is an antidote to conformity, but artists are a minority in society. If you are subject to conformity, we can also suffer as a community. So the question is, how do you heal an entire group? Ignacio Martin Barro, born in 1942 and died in 1989, was born in Spain but spent most of his life in Latin America. Through his research, he came to the conclusion that trauma was more a community issue rather than individual. For him, while mental problems could happen under normal circumstances, some other mental illnesses were the results of a harsh man-made environment, such as brutal oppression of some regimes. His solution was liberation psychology, in which his focus was on improving the lives of those marginalized in society. 
many traumatic experiences among people, particularly in El Salvador, Argentina, Chile, and other Latin American countries he studied, were caused by dictatorship, wars, and violence in general. His conclusion was that psychological problems are often context-driven and reflects the history and politics of the place involved. While Martin Barrow's antidote to social trauma was liberation and self-governance, another psychologist offered the choice to be part of a community as an antidote to loneliness and suffering as it empowered us to take responsibility. William Glasser, born in 1925 and died in 2013, was an American psychologist. In 1956, he developed what is called choice theory, which is a kind of utilitarian approach in which individuals are driven by increasing their pleasure and avoiding pain. But the best way we can achieve these goals is within a social community. Since we are by nature social beings, or a bunch of social animals, are as Aristotle has said 2,500 years ago, therefore our natural or instinctive urge to belong to a community is as strong as our urge to find food or find partner. The only way we feel fulfilled is through society. While society allows us fulfillment, but on the flip side, most of our psychological problems are also caused by our relationships with others, including family, friends, colleagues, and society in general. Glasser offered what he called reality therapy, which is based on taking responsibility for the choices we make. This is very similar to existentialist philosopher John Paul Sartre, as well as Soren Kierkegaard. In other words, we understand and accept the reality of our lives and take responsibility for our actions. But this can only be achieved if individuals are free to make choices. If we are forced to conform, one cannot have the options to make choices. While some societies allow us to make certain choices, it all varies from country to country or culture to culture. One of the deepest psychological and freedom is what's called this process of normalization. Every society has certain norms and anyone who deviates from those norms are either punished or ostracized as crazy. Eliad Aronson, born in 1932, and his 1972 book, The Social Animal, argued that we are all crazy in some way, and given the right time and place, we may act in a crazy way. Those who do crazy things are not necessarily crazy, he said. He looked at a shooting that happened in 1970 when armed officers shot dead some anti-war protesters. Aronson studied the reaction of the people in town who wanted to spread rumors that the protesters were bad people in order to prove that the officers did nothing wrong. Those false rumors were the results of cognitive dissonance when two contradictory beliefs force you to change the narrative. We somehow justify some acts of cruelty simply to avoid the emotional conflict it causes us if we accept the truth. For example, the discomfort a family of a criminal feels when helping the police to capture the culprit. Change versus familiarity. While society prefers clear norms and pushes individuals to conform, some individuals do not follow these norms. So this battle between norm and rebellion will continue as long as we live. And this struggle is an important factor in social change. So there's a tension between social norms and individual freedom. Martin Seligman, born in 1942, is an American psychologist who argued that we are the happiest when in good social relationships. Quote, Good social relationships are like food and thermoregulation, universally important to human mood. During his research, he noticed that the happiest people were those who were good with other people. But being good is one thing, changing a society for the good is a whole different thing. Robert Zajong, born in 1923 and died in 2008, was a Polish-American psychologist who wanted to understand the relation between feeling and thought. He carried out studies which became known as the mere exposure effect. He read an article about a student who attended his class in a black bag. At first, other students were hostile towards him, but as time went on, they became familiar with the sight and slowly accepted his bizarre clothing item. In 1968, Zajong developed a series of experiments in which he showed his participants a series of images and some Chinese symbols. 
He observed that the longer these subjects were exposed to those images and symbols, the more close they felt towards those images. The participants claimed that these images were their own, which led Zhejiang to conclude that the more you see it, the more you like it. A good example might be a security blanket among babies. The more you spend time with someone or something, the higher likelihood of you being attached to them. This led Zhejiang to conclude that our preferences are not always rational but deeply emotional. He also argued that while thoughts and feelings are separate, all thoughts are somehow attached to feelings. Today, advertisers target people precisely because the more you see their products, the more we accept them, perhaps not on a rational level, but on an emotional level. Another example is when animals are exposed to something, at first they show fear and aggression. But when they realize nothing happens, they accept it. We tend to be fearful and hostile towards new people, new experiences and changes. But the more we spend time with them, we come to accept them. Zhejiang also studied couples and long-term relationships. He noticed a bizarre effect which seems unbelievable. He looked at their wedding photographs and then compared those photos with their photographs after 25 years of living together. He found that the couples look more alike after 25 years than when they first met. In other words, they looked very different when they got married, but after spending 25 years together, even their physiology had changed to conform to each other. He argues that the more you spend time with someone, the more you develop empathy for others, and as a result, your facial expressions mimic one another. Perhaps we all have seen couples who look like one another, then they are different. Another explanation could be that we choose our mate who is more similar to us than different in order to ensure our similar genes survive. So perhaps a couple mimicking each other's facial expression is in a way to mimic that we are from the same gene pool or tribe. But when it comes to society, nothing is written in stone. We change as we evolve biologically and socially. But this change is also subtle that we do not clearly see the forces at play. While Hegel and Marx talked about the force of history, what is that invisible force that changes society and individuals? Kurt Levin, who was born in 1890 and died in 1947, a German-American psychologist, is often credited as the father of social psychology, who was active in the 1940s, when three dominant ideologies, socialism, fascism and liberalism, were battling one another. According to behavior psychology, individuals are mostly at the mercy of the environment, while Levin wanted to know whether the individual can also affect the environment in return. In his field theory, he argues that one cannot understand a system or environment unless one tries to change it. By changing a system, one realizes the forces that are at play. It's like you want to uproot a tree. Then you realize the roots and how deep they are. Or you cannot understand the force of a river until you try to change its course. The same is true about society. The Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy argued that historical events are not caused by leaders, but by a variety of forces from the soldiers to the cooks to the ordinary peasants. Levin's theory is based on the interdependence of individuals within a group. Any social change is often met with resistance, but once people see a rationale behind the move, they concede. He studied dietary change during World War II and found that once the participants knew the benefits of such change, they came on board. Change is terrifying at first until proven safe or necessary. Social psychology has mainly focused on two fronts, how the individual is influenced by the group. Studies in the 60s and 70s showed that the group or authority has a huge influence on how we behave. In extreme situations, we do things that are horrible in order to conform with others or comply with authority or simply play a role we are given. Other social psychologists focus on the choices we make and how society is the source of our happiness, fulfillment and meaning in life, yet our social relations are also the cause of many of our mental problems. In the next segment, I'll look at child psychology.